Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of the Low Code Cafe. Uh, today, we'll be talking a lot about security. This is a, been a, has been a topic that has been brought up uh, over and over again by our uh, participants. And today, we'll not get to cover uh, all the concepts about security, but uh, especially the security that are uh, built into the product. Uh, but before that, for those of you that are new to this uh, webinar, just to give you a brief uh, introduction. Uh, this is a webinar that we do every week. It's mostly about uh, team and uh, community. Uh, it's a webinar, a technical webinar, where we get to discuss uh, what's coming, new releases, new features, but also uh, go into the hands-on part and see something actually uh, being uh, done. <clears throat> this webinar is recorded. Uh, so all past editions are available on our uh, YouTube channel. Uh, we'll post the link in the chat message uh, in a moment. And uh, usually we have the same uh, agenda. We'll start uh, giving some highlights of what's happening uh, new in the community. And then we'll have uh, Reza, our head of product, uh, show us uh, upcoming releases, new features that are being added. Uh, then we'll get into the uh, hand um, the learning, the knowledge that uh, we gain from our support channel, so topics, hot topics that our, our uh, users are bringing up. And finally, the biggest uh, uh, chunk of this uh, webinar is about hands-on uh, development. Uh, so far, we built systems with low code. We built a task management system. We built a marketing system. So if you want to see how those were built, you can go back uh, and uh, watch the entire series. And today, as I mentioned, it will be a special edition because we'll be talking security uh, in general. <laughs> Good. So uh, probably most of you uh, already know that we've uh, opened up uh, investments in, uh, in our company and uh, we, we've received a very, very uh, warm uh, 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 thoughts until now and also a lot of people in the community already became investors and I'm proud to announce that we just uh, reached the 100,000 uh, milestone so that's a six digit uh, milestone for us. We are off to uh, continue this campaign it will still be open for uh, another three months so uh, our goal is to raise $500,000 and we'll use this money to scale up everything that is related to plant and from the business side, sales, marketing, and everything, to the technical sides, more features, um, and so on. So uh, in case you haven't checked it out, again, we'll post the link on the uh, chat window, and you can, uh, you can see uh, where we're at. It's a very interesting page to read just the story of low code. Cool. And uh, another thing that I want to start uh, in this local cafe, and this will be the first one when, uh, that I'm doing it, is also feature some of the case studies, what uh, people are building with Plant and App, right? So far, we've seen like, how do we put all the bits, of, bits and pieces, like the technicalities behind it, you know, but knowing what people out there are building with it, the ultimate goal, I think it will be a very, very interesting perspective. So I'll, I will start doing this every week, bringing a new case studies that we built or our customers have built or our partners have built and feature it uh, in this uh, uh, webinar. So also, if you have any uh, use cases or any case studies that you want uh, featured in this uh, low code cafe, I would be very happy to discuss and I, can, I could present it or uh, we could have you present it as well. Cool. So uh, this uh, first uh, case study that I'm going to show is called an EAP uh, system, so Employee Assistance Program. Uh, basically, it's about uh, giving this benefit to employees to get uh, uh, mental uh, health sessions uh, from therapists. So organizations give these benefits to their employees. And usually it's a system where uh, you have on one hand therapists that get onboarded, so uh, uploading their documentation being approved and so on. And on the other hand, you have uh, employees that go into the system to find their uh, therapy schedule sessions. And at the end of the month, uh, everything is put together and billing is automated because therapists will get paid by the organization. And the story behind this, because it's not just about building system, it's about the story, right? So uh, this uh, particular case study, it's a hospital in uh, Colorado, Vail Health it's called. And their problem was that they had a high suicide rate in their community, especially among teenagers. 
So the hospitals and other members of the community put uh, created like a 60 million budget to build this program for the uh, entire community. Um, so uh, uh, what, what they did, I mean, the money were there not for building the system. The system was actually uh, delivered uh, through plant and app and the MVP, the first version, it, uh, it took uh, two developers 20 days to deliver. So again, very fast uh, uh, go to market, which, you know, in some cases, like in these cases, that might translate to lives, lives being saved, right? Uh, <clears throat> and then uh, um, I think uh, uh, once we had this uh, case study, what happened, actually, we find new organizations and uh, new uh, mental health uh, providers that found interesting in this system, because this is a popular concept. You know, especially nowadays in the COVID era where people are more isolated, more remote, you know, to have this kind of program for employees. Uh, there is also a video uh, where we recorded the demo of this uh, system. So happy to post all these links on the chat uh, channel in a bit. And in case if you uh, know anyone, if you if your organization is something like this, I'd be happy to uh, arrange a demo, see what it was built and get to build something like that uh, yourself or with the help of us or a partner. Cool. So very, very interesting stories. And uh, as I mentioned, I'm looking forward to featuring uh, your stories as well, because I think, you know, that's ultimately that's what technology is about. You know, what difference do we make in the world? Cool. So I think uh, we are now ready to move on to uh, uh, Reza to give us some product uh, roadmap updates, see what's coming, and maybe we can get to see, get to have a sneak peek as, as, at some of those features. Hey, Bogdan, thank you. Uh, go ahead and leave yours up. I'll share in a second, but uh, if you just want to go to the roadmap, I, I just have a um, kind of a quick update to give today. So this release, we've been at it for a, a little while now, probably six weeks or so. Uh, it's a very big release. We found out about um, the release candidate for DNN 9.8 uh, during this release and decided to position ourselves to make sure that we supported that. And, and um, so, you know, there's been a couple of delays. Um, we are really close and have a good stable release coming. I think just there's uh, so much that's happened here and there's fundamental changes to architecture, especially around the areas of licensing and um, the new calendar view and things coming out. And kind of one of the top guiding principles that I have with the team is do no harm, right? And wanna make sure we uh, don't break anything that people have and stuff, especially in, in a, you know, the name of getting some new features out. So we decided we wanted to take a couple extra weeks and just make sure that everything is good and gonna be backwards compatible and things. And so we're gonna delay a little bit. Uh, we have a little bit of beta availability right now um, uh, and have been giving that out to some people where there was a need on certain modules, a bug fix, something like that. I've uh, been working with several clients who have been testing along the way with us in this release. That's been very helpful. Um, happy to report have not found any issues with DNN 9.8 compatibility. Uh, primarily, we've been focused that testing on the current release and the last release uh, 1.9. And the, so that would translate to the 5.9 modules uh, and the 5.10 have had no issues there. So I know um, some people are very early adopters and I expect there's people already uh, upgrading. I believe that was released yesterday uh, officially from DNN. Um, your results may vary the further back you go. The general guidance I would give is just like uh, DNN 9.7. So there is a matrix that we have out and uh, that you can see on any of the download pages of what the compatibility of the modules are with different versions of DNN and what we recommend. And I would say this one's going to follow 9.7. I don't see much difference uh, between 9.8 and 9.7 as far as uh, features that, that could be breaking, right? There's a lot of neat enhancements and different things in there from the DNN community, uh, but nothing that's uh, earth shattering architecturally under the hood. It's very similar to 9.7. So I think you'll be okay there. As always, make sure that uh, if you're gonna try it out, please, please, please back up <laughs> and test first. Uh, future you will thank you always one of these days. Uh, so with that said, um, that's kind of where we are. I anticipate that uh, 
early next week, we'll be at a point of having the release candidate locked down. We always like to upgrade and install all of the things that uh, are, you know, we eat our own dog food here and a lot of the systems and things that drive our internal operations and uh, the way we manage our build pipelines and everything else, the dnnsharp.com, all of this obviously is built uh, on DNN Sharp and Plantin app. And so we like to upgrade all of our own stuff and um, let it cook for a week and just make sure that um, nothing, no gremlins were hidden in the hood. And then we go ahead and release officially out to everyone. And so I anticipate that'll happen um, not next week, but the following week that we'll go ahead and officially release. Uh, based on that, then it kind of puts us in position where we'll probably only have one more release this year. It'll be late in December. Uh, and then the 112 release will move out into January. So the 111 release, which we are working on, have started on, uh, is very much focused on uh, entity stability uh, and and uh, kind of maturing some of the, the different features and capabilities that happen when you create a new entity and an entity builder, uh, the different pages and layouts and things that are created for you, the workflows, the APIs, that sort of stuff, and just tying it all together and make sure there's a really good, solid, uh, polished experience there is where I want to see us land at the end of this year going into next year. So we can have that great foundation then to keep building on next year. So that's what's coming there. Uh, given that, now I'm bugged on, if you don't mind uh, stopping your screen share, I did want to demo uh, something that is shipping in 110, um, really cool feature. Uh, and I think it's been asked for for a long time and, and has been needed for a long time. Um, so let me find the right screen to share. I believe it's this one. One sec. Always I have way too much open on the screen at once. Yep. Okay. So got a little uh, test site here. And uh, what the feature I want to show you is a lot of times when you define an entity, I guess I'll just start here. Um, and you create your properties, you define them, right? And they're, you know, you can move fast, you can build quick. And a lot of times these things are in your head and you're just entering them in as they're there. You come back later, realize you missed something, need to add something. And they're always uh, added to the bottom of the list. And the order that these are defined in uh, completely is tied to the order that they're represented on the screens and grids and, and um, user interface that's generated for you based on these. And then if you wanted to change them, you'd have to come and edit the various uh, features and modules, your forms, your layouts, and things like that to get them right. And so what we've got now is the ability to, and I'll just create a new one here together. And what you'll see is that you have the ability to reorder these as you're defining them. And I could say, you know, in reality, this really should have been field four. And I need, and I'm missing a field one. And you notice it put it there at the bottom, but I want that to be the first field that's shown in my grid and my forms um, and on the layout. So you still create just as you always would have. So you see that I had the ability to change things and move as I'm defining. And everything has followed the order that I laid there in real time, right? Um, let's just throw a few records in. So everything is, is numbered accordingly. My grid is laid out accordingly. My form is laid out accordingly. But then I decide that uh, I want to add a field or I want to change the uh, layout, right? And so I can now come back and I can swap these two around and add another one. 
So the order that I'm expecting to see, everything's ordered sequentially right now. And what I want to see is one, three, two, four, six, five. So when I save and override, you'll see that it's on my grid, one, three, two, four, six, five. On my form, it's one, three, two, four, six, five. And on my detail view, it's one, three, two, four, six, five. Now, so this, this is great and solid and works wonderful out of the box. However, what happens if you have changed the layout um, of your form, for example, or of the grid? If you had manually gone in, especially this mostly applies to you know, things that were you've overridden existing and you've got things the way you want now. We didn't have this capability before. You've reordered things manually. The way it works right now to get this out is kind of back to that do no harm. The system's going to detect that you've made changes and it's going to not mess with those. And so in this case, I have this form and I've decided I didn't want my fields all just to run in order. And I've got them as one, two, three, four, and five side by side and six. Everything else is the same though, right? The, the grid is running across in order. The detail is running across in order. And so when I come in here, and if I decide I want to um, swap just two and three around, right? And so now I, I want one, three, two, four, five, six to be on my grid and everywhere, but I don't want to have to go and, and reset that up in my form so that they're side by side. You'll notice that the grid has gotten the change, three comes before two. The detail has gotten the change. Three comes before two. However, my form has not been touched. It's still one and two side by side. So it didn't go try to put three up here next to two. Now we'll keep advancing this. I'm definitely looking for some feedback and input on this as you start using it. Uh, obviously, this gets very complex. There's a whole lot you can do once you start overriding these things. And so the same pattern for now is going to hold true. If you've changed the order of things on the grid, if you've changed the data types or the field types, and so maybe I've got a, a large text and it's just showing me a large text, but I made it a, uh, a, a trumbo wig, right? Anytime we detect that you have overridden uh, the, the properties or the layout of the fields on the form or the grid, uh, we're not going to touch it. We're going to leave it at as is, and that's then still for you to come. So it's like you've taken control uh, a little bit away. We'll still add new fields and things like that. Uh, fields that you haven't touched or messed with, they will still get rearranged. But if you've come in and you've changed things uh, on those specific things you've changed, we're going to keep our hands off of it. And, and then it's kind of to you to make those changes. And, and so we'll either just preserve the layout as you've laid it out, uh, uh, we'll definitely add your new things because those haven't been customized or overridden yet, right? So your your new things will propagate into the system. Now, in this case, you know, field seven would show up under field six, but if I had four and five here side by side, um, and, and a six, and I come and say I want to put uh, maybe seven, I want it to land uh, between three and four. It's not. It's going to land here at the end, and then it's for you to pick where it goes. So we'll definitely document this up. We'll have a video that explains this a little bit better. Um, but the, the key thing here is that anything new you're creating, uh, and if it was born with this capability, you're going to be totally fine. Anything that you've created in the past uh, and have not uh, overridden or rearranged by hand, they're just the kind of vanilla out of the box ones, you're going to be fine. Reorder them, rearrange them. They're still in the purview of the entity builder. Um, but if you've come in and you've customized and, and, and changed and overridden field types or the order of things, we're going to go ahead and not try to guess right now what you would want us to do in that case and how you would want us to rearrange that. That's, that's really in your control and your purview to kind of keep controlling that layout manually then. So I can pause here for questions if there are any or otherwise uh, I can move on. Great, nice feature. I think that's going to be very handy. I've certainly bumped up against that one uh, as I've done some development. Me too. <laughs> All right. Um, so um, moving on then to our, our next segment from the trenches. Um, 
couple of things going on that I wanted to mention. One, we've got uh, our, our um, Patrick Anderson has developed a new low code feature focus that talks about using linked drop downs and SQL data source and action forms. So if you're not already subscribed to the uh, uh, plant and app channel, we, uh, we encourage you to do so. And uh, these we, we tend to be putting one or two a week into this playlist. And uh, so these are just nuggets of um, five minutes, 10 minutes of uh, addressing particular features. So there's a new one out. Um, there was a question on the um, on our community forum that um, talks about, uh, was asking about uh, the, really it's kind of a repeating question that we see, which is how to build an email that uh, you've got a hundred fields on your form. You only want to include the ones that have information in them. And uh, so I'm, I've already recorded and, and now editing down a video that uh, shows yet another technique for um, grabbing those fields and building an email or otherwise being able to work with your fields that are on your form in a programmatic way. So uh, that will be out in the next day or so. So again, sign up for that one. So last week I got flustered. I was uh, demonstrating a, 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 on a capture information form. We were going to download a custom PDF. That was what we we're going to do uh, as we were demonstrating embedding a, uh, a form within a form. And uh, I just I, I, I made a programming error. That's what it turned out to be. And uh, since, since I get a segment once a week, I get a chance to uh, do a little redemption here. So here was the problem. If I filled in the form and, um, and hit send now, I was expecting that a PDF would generate and would be available immediately to download. Um, and it turns out that there's a programming error, and, and in five minutes I found what the problem was, but of course the, the webinar was over by that point. So um, in trying to debug these kind of things, it's, uh, you know, I think it's probably as useful for you to see that uh, we make mistakes and, what, and, and trying to figure out um, you know, how to address them. So my send button had three sim uh, simple actions. We were doing a server request to get a page, we're generating a PDF, and sending it to a URL. Should have been pretty straightforward, uh, but let's see if we can spot the mistake. I, uh, we were getting the page from uh, this URL. We were putting it into uh, an output token called Republic page, and then went on to generate a PDF. We use the Republic page, plus the first name and the last name of the person who was entering the form uh, to generate a custom PDF for them and we're outputting it into something called Republic URL. That was where we stored the URL of the resulting PDF. So the final step was just send them this URL. And when I got going, I put in the Republic page instead. So we're trying to send them a, a document instead of a URL, and that was my mistake. So dropping that in here, making that one fix, and notice force download is checked. When I save that and try again, um, if there's any hope of redemption, here it is. And so I hit send now, and hopefully it's going to do the work and uh, end up giving me a PDF. And so now we have a PDF. I click on it to open it. And so we have this uh, plant and app page and notice it says custom document for Dale Warner. So we've built a custom PDF um, from a page that we scraped off the internet. Um, so it, re redemption is possible, that worked. So um, that's, that's uh, fixing last week's problem. We talked last week about adding, um, uh, being able to embed a form within a form. And this one, uh, this was the demonstration of that. But uh, the topic came up, Radu mentioned, oh yeah, we can put grids inside of grids. And if you haven't done that uh, as, as I hadn't, I find that that's just an incredibly useful technique. And I'm gonna demonstrate that today. So I've created two entities in my plant and app. One is um, people, um, and we have three people that we, uh, Dale, Radu and Bogdan. And uh, for each of these, I have a separate entity called history. And so um, we have different history events that have happened for these different people. 
So it occurs to me it would be nice if when I'm looking at um, uh, these people that I could have a drill down and see their history. And that's what we're gonna build today. So I am just going to go to a page I've already added to my, to my environment. It's an empty page and I'm going to add a grid. And the grid is going to be the history grid that's going to get embedded. So we'll build that up first. It's not very difficult. So we drop a grid on the form and we manage it and we're going to do it from scratch and we're going to include the history entity. And that's as far as I'm going to go so far. We'll, we'll do a couple of iterations here so you can kind of see the process of building it. I'm going to include the person, description, history date, and the person name as fields. And I just know I'm going to want the person name a little bit to the front here and save. So that's step one. We take a look at what, what we get out of it. We get a nice grid and it's searchable and we could turn on sorting and things if we wanted to, but uh, just a basic grid. So my next step is going to be to enhance this so I can show only a, a particular person using uh, the URL. So we'll go in and customize this. And I like to give things a name. So embedded history. And um, we're going to, we are going to change the data source of this to add a where clause. And it's going to be person name is like the um, get of person name from the command line. And I'm, gonna, uh, and I'm going to say that the default of that is a percent sign. So if they don't put in a person name, it's still gonna return everybody. So this will still work. But if you put in a person name on the command line, you're gonna get a uh, filtering down to a particular person. So when we refresh this and go to our command line, we add, a parameter, we filter down to just uh, my records or so the filtering now works. The last step that we need to do here is just activate this for embedding. So I'm going to customize this one more time and go down to the advanced section and say that I want to embed. And this gives us the script, same as we saw last week, the script that we can uh, Im embed elsewhere. So we'll save that. And now to our objective, we were going to enhance the people listing to include that. So we'll add a history button to this. We're gonna do this in two steps. So first we customize the listing and in the item buttons, there's this special button thing that allows you to add inline details. So we're gonna add the inline details here and the data source view, uh, detail view, this is what's gonna show when that button is clicked. The, or I'm actually gonna name the button history. And in, the, in my first step here, I'm just gonna throw out all the fields that are on the grid, the ID and the name, so that we can see that it works. We're not embedding the grid yet. Um, so when we refresh and try that out, what we get is when we click, we see my ID and my name. So the, fun, the only thing left to do is to uh, uh, actually embed our other grid. And so if we go uh, and enhance that history button and change the detail view, instead of doing that, we're going to go in and look at the HTML and we're gonna paste that code that we copied from before. And then we're going to use, uh, we're going to and, uh, update the URL that's going to go to, it's got this uh, uh, complex URL, it's the same thing we've talked about in last week. We're going to add person name equal name. So whatever row that we're on, that's the name that we're going to uh, generate the, this grid for. And we save and refresh. So now when we look at the history button for Dale, we get a grid that loads that just my information. And if this was, you know, more, more history, we have our search and we could, um, we could search within that to get a, a sub result. And in the same way, if we look at 
other people's records, we get their history. So it's a nice technique to do drill down. Um, so um, let's see, I think that's, um, I'm gonna jump back here. Uh, that's all we had uh, today. We're talking about embedding grids. Um, and unless there are any questions, I'm going to pass this on. Mr. Radu, you would like to join in? So uh, as, as Bogdan mentioned, we're going to uh, just take, take a break from um, the marketing system and uh, talk about security in general. We could uh, at harden that system or other systems with the techniques that are that we're going to talk about here. But we found that uh, we really just wanted to talk about um, uh, security in general and not really constrain it. We'll come back to this topic uh, once or twice more with some more advanced concepts. But those are just going to be interspersed. We'll probably go back to the marketing system next week. But hello, Radu. Okay. So hello, everyone. Um, today I would like to show you some uh, best practices for security, some things that you should take care of when you are developing. Um, uh, there, those are some simple things that uh, I would like to show you today. Some, some, and we can get in more complex uh, topics uh, maybe later. But let let me let me present you my, my first situation where uh, where I, I built it an action form but I, I did it in, in such a way that it's insecure. So what's happening here? I have two buttons, as you can see, support and staff. And I have a dropdown here that is gonna let me, depending on what I choose from, uh, from the dropdown, is gonna enable either uh, the staff button or the support button. Uh, let's, let's, let's give it a quick look how it's built. And I'm gonna show you what, I'm not, let's say what exploit um, can can be done in this situation. So it, it's pretty simple. Uh, I have a drop down with two entries, support and staff, and two buttons. And the buttons themselves are only just going to show a message. But the, the important thing is that I'm enabling the button only when roll and roll is the drop down. It's either support or in the staff button. It's either staff. So uh, staff, exactly. Well, the problem here is, so I can click on support and it's gonna say, uh, say support. I can click on staff and it's gonna say staff. But what happens if, uh, if, if someone, I'm not gonna say a hacker, but what, what happens if uh, it's someone that doesn't want the good of the, of the system will just go and uh, enable this button via the browser console. So something like to do something like this, you you inspect the button, and you can find the disabled property, and you can just click on. You can delete this. Click outside, and you see now I have both of the buttons enabled, and I can click on support, and I can click on staff. So what's what the problem here is that I'm I'm relying only on the front end, only on what the JavaScript could do to enforce my security so and that's that's never a good practice so let's let's try something else i'm and i'm going to encourage um, the viewers if they have any idea what i can do here just to type in chat or i can show you really simple this this is something the problem is that the problem is that when i'm clicking the button here, the, the set of actions that I want to execute on those buttons, they are not checking if the actual dropdown is set. It's set to. It's set to either. Uh, it's set to either support, or uh, staff. So a good a good way to to enforce the security here is to just set a condition to say you're gonna uh, you're gonna execute this action to say support only when my dropdown is actually support and what the uh, and why and let, let's let's maybe do this first to both of the buttons to both of the actions sorry and let's see how it's going to behave now so this is the step All right i can click save i am going to close this so keep in mind i still have two the two buttons enabled 
and I can click now if I click on support it's just going to refresh the page because it's, it's refusing to execute the, the specific action that was here because it's not respecting one rule so the, if you want to click the support button you have to have the support um, the support drop down to be on support so what we're actually doing right now we are not relying anymore on the javascript uh, on the front end sorry uh, on the front end security we're creating our own uh, back end security logic and that's that's to also enforce that the drop down it's this it has the the proper value for the action to execute action actions workflows or whatever is going to go uh under your your button that you want to click okay so this is this is a simple one so i have another one <coughs> um another example here same same rule two buttons the only difference here is that those buttons only get shown when I have the proper role to see it. So let's let's uh, see exactly what I did in this. So there are two simple buttons. They do the same thing, but the only the only difference is that uh, you have to you have to have a specific role to push that button. And I created and maybe I can show you also this. I created in. Um, in advance to two, two roles, uh, one which is called support and one which is called staff. And uh, I, I set and I set this token has role and the name of the uh, of the uh, role. And this uh, this can return either true or either false. So putting it in the show condition, it is gonna show or not show uh, a button. So I have the two, I have the two, I have, I've added the two roles here in my configuration. And I also have a user uh, here that at this moment has both of, uh, both staff and support. All right. Uh, so now I can click, I can click on those buttons because with this account that I'm here, I'm a super user, but I'm also logged in in a, on a, on an incognito window here with uh, with the with the user that had sorry uh, both support and uh, and staff role and he can also click them without any problem. Now let's let's uh, let's uh, let's play a little bit with the security with the security role of uh, of the this user. So if I if I for example right now I I remove the support role for him, she, he, he shouldn't see anymore the, the support button. So if I, I, I remove it really quickly and I refresh the page, he cannot see the button anymore, so he cannot uh, click on it. Now, let me put it back for a brief moment and show both buttons and let me get it, uh, remove it, uh, remove it again. So I'm gonna remove the support, uh, the support pro. So right now I, I'm in a situation where here, the, the user on, on the right side of the screen, it's seeing the support button, but doesn't have, is not allowed to press the support button. And what I'm, and if I click on it, it's gonna say the button you click is not enabled. So what I, what I want, I wanted to show you in this situation, we are handling not only when uh, rendering the form, when displaying the form on the, on the page, uh, we are handling security, but we also handle security when you push the button. So we, we check again to see if the user or the rules and it can be a, a role and it can be a, a token that has a different, uh, a different uh, security method. We are reevaluating that when you click the button again to see if you are still able to so do not, you know, click on something that you are not supposed to do. And this can work in, this can work in a, in a other situation as well. Maybe you can only click a button one minute and after one minute, you cannot click it anymore. So even, even if you see the button for an hour, what if you didn't click it, it's gonna throw you the button you click is not enabled error. All right, let's go back here. So we did the buttons uh, and I would like now to show you, and this is, uh, this is actually, um, a ticket, well, a bunch of tickets that came through support uh, in the last years, and uh, people didn't understand a, a specific thing that we are 
evaluating some of the conditions. So we evaluate in the majority, I think I, all, of, all of the security, we also we evaluated on front end, but we also evaluated on, uh, on back end. So I have here uh, just an entity that I created and uh, I did a small adjustment to it. Uh, the, uh, the gender field that you see here, it all, it's only gonna be uh, shown and required when I specify, when I uh, check this checkbox. And if I try to click uh, add as it is now, I see that I have the first name and the last name as required fields. Uh, if I also uh, say that I, uh, I want to specify the gender and click add again, well, the gender at this point is required, but I, I don't get any, uh, any, uh, any message that this field is actually required. If I start filling my, my, my first name and my, uh, and my last name, now if I try to click add again, now I get the, this field is required error. So why is this happening? Then to answer these questions, I will need to go and show you uh, the, the configuration that I did for, I did for uh, this form. So uh, the, gender, the gender field here, and I'm gonna expand bind tokens and validation. So I'm sh to show and hide a field, you can use expression like this and expression, those expression are executed in JavaScript. So those are executed on the front end. It's just the browser doing its thing. But the, uh, but the validation condition, so I only want to make this field required when I have the specified gender checkbox true. This one, it's gonna go and evaluate, it supports C-sharp syntax, which is, means that this is gonna go and evaluate on backend. And this is also to protect from, from hackers that are trying to, to send fake you know, uh, data that are not coming from your form. So, so the idea is something like this. What, what if someone tries to you know, uh, in, inter, intercept the request and says, here's, here's some data that I, I didn't actually send, for, is, is, or not, is not the data I sent. So I'm, I'm asking to see, to actually see if the gender was sent to the server before I can take the decision if the, uh, the gender is or not required. So if I have the checkbox true, I say, okay, I also need to have uh, a value for the gender. If I have it to false, I don't need to have uh, a value for the gender. Um, so that's why in some specific situation, if you click add, not, uh, well, when you click add, not all the fields are, uh, are required at the same time because, and this is a fine line between a performance and security. Because for the first name and last name, we know that those fields are required, but they are not conditioned by anything. So we can evaluate those. Con if, if we can evaluate those on front end. So we can let the JavaScript to say, well, if if this field is empty, this is required. While for the gender, we are basing our information uh, based on an other field. So yes, that we can do we can do the front end validation. But what happens if some a hacker tries to send uh, different information? Maybe it tries to send a true gender, but uh, specify gender as true, but no gender. So we evaluate again this on the back on the backend side to just to ensure the uh, the data is properly uh, um, sent to the database. So a quick question for you: Is, is it a isn't it a, a good best practice to always make those conditions uh, the show condition and the um, um, condition for the uh, the show condition and the um, validation, validation condition. Isn't it a good idea to make those the same? Yes. There, there's a, there's another reason that comes into play when um, it, I mean those two. when a, when a field gets hidden and um, yet is required. If you don't have that conditional, like that that can prevent a form from saving, even though you can't see the the field. Yes, if you yes, and and that's again because of the backend validation. If if I say a field is required, but if you are not showing it to the end user, and he cannot enter value in, into it, then you get in a you get in a you get a, that that specific form when it's trying to send is going to say, well, uh, this field is required, and you didn't send it to me. I'm going to try to attach the error to the field. Exactly as you are seeing here. So let me yep. 
let me exactly let me put this exactly here. So it's trying to attach the error to the field, but because the field is not visible, it doesn't have where to attach the error. So you're just gonna be stuck in clicking the update button without anything right. happening because you you get an error, but we cannot attach the error to the proper field. So that's that's a very so, good point, Dale. So as a best practice, making those two be the same when you're when you're doing a show, that's that's a, a typically a good idea. Yep, and uh, the condition when you're writing conditions, usually C sharp and JavaScript can use the same syntax. So if you write, uh, if you're you're writing for one of the um, one of the uh, one of the conditions, uh, let's get here. So if I write it, if I write it for bind expression, I can just copy and uh, put it to the validation and paste it, and also check the. And keep in mind. Maybe this is something I, I, I should specify. Keep in mind that those uh, this condition applies for required and also for the validators. So this can also apply, for example, for an email validator. So I only want uh, I all I only want to validate for email if this condition is going to be true, and it's also required. So it's a combination of all of those. And and we have a, a comment from. Uh, one of the attendees today that you uh, pointing out, you can still mark the gender field to be required with CSS in the field UI. Yes, yes, you you can do that. That's uh, that's true. I was just trying to so I was just trying to 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 give an example of how the security works from a from the from a, the coding perspective. Yep. Um, and uh, we can uh, we can jump into one of my favorite subjects, uh, the SQL injection. Uh, also, I saw this question um, a lot, a lot, a lot of times um, in the in in my history with the team. Uh, so, and there are, there are two things that I want to point here. Um, you can. And you know, to, when when you want, run, want to write something to the SQL database, you you're, you usually write an insert query. Now, with Plant and App, you, do, you you don't need to do that anymore because we are generating actions to create entries in the entities, so you don't need to do that anymore. But historically speaking, uh, you have three three ways to do that. It's either you use now the uh, Plant and App action, you use a SQL query and you send parameters through bind parameters, or you use inline tokens inside your SQL query. And what I wanted to show you here is either all of those three works, and for people that maybe aren't with Plant and App for that, that long of a time, let me show you a little bit the differences between those three buttons. So uh, this is the add with plant and app. So add with plant and app is going to give you an action to uh, an action where you can specify the fields and it's going to do the insert for you. Uh, with bind parameters, uh, I replaced the the create new uh, entry with a small SQL and I'm binding I'm binding the parameters here through the through tokens here. So this token is going to transform to this variable and you can specify it with at uh, in front. So this, those are going to be declares in SQL and they're going to be strings. Or uh, an alternative is to put the tokens, um, to put the tokens inside, uh, inside the um, double, inside codes here as strings and the, the SQL can uh, uh, use those also. I won't, I, I don't recommend anymore the last option uh, because it's slowing a little bit down the execution because we each time we have to check to see if there are tokens that we are need to replace and if they are if we and we we find tokens we need to replace them in the query so it's may i i would like to say it's not the best option it's going to slow down a little bit the execution of that button and in big quantities it, you can really see the difference uh if you are still using the sql query i recommend this option where we are putting the the parameters through the parameter values, and also and my in and 
when you have the option, please use the generated ones from the SQL query. They're also enforcing the entity security. So if this is a big deal. You don't need to, to, to have another look of, of that. So this is my, my, my uh, best option uh, if, if I have to choose. What I wanted to show that both all three work perfectly and they are secure. They are not going to decode the parameters are not going to get executed anywhere in the in the query. And now, uh, I will take this. I would like to take the discussion in the into the SQL injection part. So, uh, for people that don't know what SQL injection uh, SQL injection is, uh, I prepared two pictures. So this is the first one, and I'm going to give you a minute to read it. So a SQL injection in usually is when uh, some of some of the parameters that we are using to run, to run a query became a, a code that can alter, delete, or update um, the, the SQL query. And usually, as you can see here, it's, it can be drop table students, uh, and it, it, they, it can delete if they know it, uh, the, the, the table name. They can also delete the whole your whole table, and if you don't have backups, then it, that's not a pretty fun uh, place to be in. So um, usually, um, I, as I hope this man here says, we need to sanitize our data ta database tables. And I have another funny picture here, and this is actually a true story. Uh, <laughs> some uh, speed traps were uh, were hacked by someone putting a very uh, a SQL injection instead of its uh, car plate. So this is <laughs> this is please. Dale, did you want to say something? No, no, that's that's funny. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. So, and I prepared an example in how we protect protect uh, the inputs in this situation. So. Behind this button, what I have, I have this, I have, I prepared this query. Uh, maybe I can just show you really quickly. Uh, I prepared this query. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to input a value here and I'm going to click run search and it's going to show up the email address of, uh, of that user ID of that particular user. But I did something wrong here. I, I didn't enforce, first of all, I didn't enforce uh, this value to be an integer on front end. So the, anyone can just come here and type whatever free text they want. And in that situation, we are going to get an error because it was expecting, it was expecting an, a user ID, which is an integer. And this, this cannot, uh, the text that I wrote there is not, uh, is not going to work anymore. But what if, what if I, I write inside the, and I have this prepared already. What if I write inside my my uh, my user ID a drop table? Uh, I don't know users or uh, let, let's go for some table. Oops, I'm sorry, some table uh, as as other examples. So the the idea is that I'm going to replace here the user ID with this malicious code here, and I'm going to get this and. What I'm seeing right here, this this one uh, exactly, and I'm gonna open my SQL really quickly here. You can see this is actually a valid SQL code, so this this can actually execute, uh, and if it can also drop my uh, drop it the students or users table, uh, and I can execute it in this in this situation. I don't have the sum table, but it, there are other two statements executed properly so this is actually uh, an exploit that people can do in on the on this uh, with the action form well if i click right now on the run search this should you know try at least to drop the table but what's gonna do you can see here it's actually saying that uh what i entered there is not an integer a proper integer uh for my query to work anymore and this is because we are double encoding every every comma that you're seeing so the the actual result here is going to be and I, I let me I, maybe i can do some extreme zooming let's see you can see here we are double encoding the comma so what double encoding the commas is we're duplicating the comma so this is gonna uh mess up the query in such way that most the certain result is gonna you're gonna get an error you're not gonna get hacked or 
you're not going to lose any uh, any of your data. So is what you're saying what we're what we're already doing is going to um, automatically help prevent in, an injection query? Yes. Yes, yes. So you cannot. The idea is that they cannot take some, uh, uh, and and this is and this is what I want. You cannot take some code from the database or to run it uh, directly because if you click run on, I, I have this proper SQL here, and I tried to run it directly. I just, uh, I just, uh, where was I here? I just took the, the that query which is valid, and I tried to run it directly in uh, my. Uh, Run SQL. This is the button. I tried. I took that SQL and I tried to run it in a SQL query, but it didn't work because we are double encoding the double double encoding the commas in uh, when execute when doing this uh, this kind of stuff. Uh, I won't recommend storing SQL into database either way, even though if you're protected, I won't recommend doing that. And if you are in a situation uh, that you actually need to for for just development reasons. Uh, you need to store some queries and you need to have some parameters and you cannot get past through our security. There is an option. Feel free to contact me or through the community portal or uh, the plant and app support and I can help you override the security feature, but I won't disclose it until someone actually really needs it. Um, that being said, uh, I think we are getting close up to the time. Yeah, yeah. I was preparing also to show some uh, encryption, but maybe we can uh, move this to, to another episode. Very good. Right. Bogdan, are you there to clear us up, close us out? <laughs> cool. Yeah, very interesting topics. And I mean, I think we only covered maybe 2% uh, of what security means uh, in uh, plant and app. We put a lot of efforts to make sure to double make sure that uh, security uh, can't be breached. Uh, so this is like the built-in features. There are many other built-in features like the new sanitized HTML actions, a lot more. Uh, but there are also other mechanisms that you can do from implementation. Like what uh, I imagine that what Rad was about to show, it was about doing uh, encryption from the implementation using maybe the tokens or the actions to, to achieve encryption. So yeah, this will be a big subject and we plan to iterate over and over it again, maybe every five, 10 episodes, we do a special edition on security uh, because it's nowadays it's a big concern for any application out there. So thanks again for being here uh, this week in this Low Code Cafe webinar. We'll be seeing each other again next week. And uh, in the meantime, if you have any feedback, any suggestions that you want to see in this webinar, or if you want to present or showcase your uh, what you are building, we'd be happy to host you. Thank you and have a wonderful week until next time.